As some of you may have noticed, you, I am not Jared, and my name is Ben. And hopefully I'm learning all your names by having some name tags out. So thanks. If you don't have one, feel free to come up and grab one. Uh, they make little tents, so you'll want to write it on both sides. Uh, I am also recording this class's screencast as a video. That will be on YouTube uh, later this week. If you want a copy of that, let Jared know, and then he can get you the link. So that won't be available until later this week. And then what else? Yeah, this class will probably run a little bit differently than what you're used to with Jared. So I apologize in advance if it's offensive or you learn something. I'm not sure which of those happens. Oh, I did. Oh. Right. So as a sort of preview of what's going to happen at the end of class, I'm going to give you some paper to write down what you learned and what was not clear. That's the feedback that you give to me so that I can improve. So I will be handing out these half sheets of paper that you can write on. So sort of in your mind, anticipate what sucks and what's good. All right. Then this little <laughs> thing like if, if you're not interactive, I really seek interactivity. And this is my sort of complaint about you know, what happens when you don't interact right, with me, then I don't know what's really going on in the classroom. That makes it hard for me to teach, and then you learn less, and it's this vicious negative cycle I try to avoid. So the cool thing is, like, this is an actual Wikipedia entry. You can go look this up. It's not actually tailored for classrooms, but it's close enough. The fun thing is, Brian Warnock, that's one of my coworkers that I work with. So he's a really cool guy. He recently retired, became a contractor, a lot of drama, but he's a cool guy. So that was his like back in the 90s hypothesis about life on the internet. So, Okay, so first I'm going to give you a quick sort of like dog and pony show about me, why you should sort of like take what I say um, for its value. <laughs> so I did not get my start in data science. I've never taken a data science course. I started out life as a mechanic on this single engine jet fighter aircraft. So I did that for seven years. That was super cool. If you have questions about that afterwards, you can ask me totally. Um, I may, not, may or may not have the answer for that. Then a really smooth transition. I went into physics as a PhD um, and got my PhD in physics, uh, working on high-performance computers. And I did that for about five years. So <laughs> those were both very formative experiences in very different ways. And I guess the takeaway from that is like the more diversity you have, the easier conversations you're going to have in real life where like, you know, somebody starts yammering on about something random, you'll have some life experience to connect to that. So don't feel bad if you have some really diverse life experiences. The other thing that I sort of got out of working in science for a while is some better understanding about how this whole science process works. And the fun thing is, like, it is totally applicable to data science, but you almost never see it. And typically, like, someone's, like, given an Excel spreadsheet, how do I make more money? That's the, like, usual data science question. It's unfortunate, but that's the reality of why you're getting paid, right, to do data science. So I, I sort of like wander around with this model in my head of how to make a better story, because usually what you're really doing is you're taking that Excel spreadsheet and you're making it into a story to convince someone, usually management, to make a different decision. And so you can sort of work into that process of like how do we make more money to actually you want to gain more knowledge about the model of the reality that you have that will make you more money, right? So if you can sort of slip in the science aspect, that's, that's my sort of bias uh, when I come into data science. Um, what I try to avoid is being what's called a data analyst. This has nothing to do with science, right? This is people like taking data, making pretty charts, and then like presenting at a meeting. That's cool, and nothing against those people. They definitely need to exist in a large bureaucracy. I'm not one of them, and I hope you don't want to be one of those guys either, because they're just super boring in my opinion. But <laughs> we need them. All right. 
so after leaving uh, academia, then I worked for the government. I do work for the government uh, for the past eight years. The scary story from that is that even though I am a scientist, I do a lot of data analysis, um, the hardest thing in a large bureaucracy is culture. It's, it's communication, right? getting the right information to the right people, all of that stuff. And it is it relies on hard data science skills that you'll learn in this class. But um, if you think you're going to avoid politics or like organizational sort of frustrations, that is a lot of data science. And you can do data science without those. You'll be you know, back in the corner trying to like work your spreadsheets and, and Python notebooks, but you won't probably be influencing the decision makers. And so the thing that you only have me for one night, but for my class and my semester, um, I try and teach the students both the soft skills, like how do you communicate with people who are not like you, um, as well as doing the data science. So um, I don't know if I, we're looking for a pen? Yeah. So if, if, I don't know if I'll be able to convince you of this tonight, but like you definitely need some soft skills. So wherever you see an option to pick those up, definitely sort of like see the value in those. They're, like everyone's like hardcore data science, that's cool, but that's like less than half the story of how you're gonna make progress in a large bureaucracy. Okay, so now I'll a little, leave a little space for questions after this, but um, how this ties back, like all that cultural stuff, what that really is, is that there are people who have stories in their head about how the bureaucracy works, how large organizations work. And little, little organizations are more emotionally driven than political, but there's a story that someone has in their head, and your role as a data scientist is to figure out what story do they have in their head, and then quantize that, right? Quant make it a numerical model of the reality, and then use the data that you collect to try and figure out, is that a valid model of reality or not? If it is, it will make predictions. If it's not, your predictions will be false. And then you can go off and create new models. So that's like how it works back into the cultural aspect. So they're all tied together in this weird sense, but this is typically like your role is to figure out what other people are thinking and then change that thinking potentially if they're wrong. All right, so, so far, has anyone had any questions that they want to like spring on me right away? Like, Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is like a really cool question because so the question was how do I work with a bureaucracy because it's very frustrating. Is that is that an accurate summation? Yeah, so I get, so we get in our organization, we get in new data scientists and they're super psyched because like we do work on cool problems. We're really smart people in the government and we're, and we're doing cool stuff. And then like you start encountering all this like, well, you know, did you fill out this form and get approved by this person to do this action, right? Blah, blah, blah. All the things that are not the data science and that usually burns people out within a year or so, right? And like, why am I there six, you know, eight years later teaching here data science? Like what is going on there, right? And I think, a couple observations. There's, in any large organization, there's some small, small number of people who are smart and motivated and doing cool stuff. And so one trick is to find those people. Like if, you, if you're sitting in an office and you're working with like eight other people, highly unlikely that those other people locally will be the ones that you need to connect to. And so it becomes sort of a social problem of how do you identify sort of the anomalous characters in your environment to figure out like, are they doing good work? Are they smart? Can I talk to them, right? So networking, I guess, is a social skill that allows you to find other people who you can leverage and you can be leveraged by. And they're usually not immediately available, right? You have to go find them. They're not, sometimes they're advertising, they're like, yeah, I'm cool, I'm fun, right? But that's almost never the case, right? Like, <laughs> they're working hard and they don't have time to advertise what's going on. So finding those people is, I would say, very critical. Otherwise, you feel like you're the only one working hard and you're isolated, right? Even though you're working with a bunch of coworkers, they may not be as energized and as excited or skilled as you. And so finding other people who you can really like, you know, find some energy with is, is helpful. If I think of something else, I will come back to that. But that's my main sort of like, don't just hunker down at your desk and think you're doing the right thing because that will burn you out quickly. 
Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Advice for a young data scientist. Is that? <laughs> mm. I think I'll have to table that one and come back to it because it's a pretty heavy question. I'd say don't be, well, I don't know, the obvious thing is like don't be scared of taking on challenges that seem too big for you. But, and like, so, so the danger is like if you tackle some big problem for, that's high visibility, you're putting yourself at a high risk of like looking stupid, right? Especially if you're new, you have no. You're not gonna, like it's a big problem. The reason that's a big problem is because other people have recognized it and not solved it. Not because you're the first person to discover this problem typically. Like everyone else has observed this problem and either it was like too risky to take on or there wasn't the um, organizational support to solve the problem. And so then it becomes a question of who else has previously worked on this and failed? Why did they fail? What will I be doing differently than them? Right? Like all these sort of like historical questions that I typically are not written down. So again, if you walk into a large organization and think, you know, I'll just solve this big problem, huh, it's weird that there's no documentation. That's because it's folklore, which I think I'll go back one slide. So like this curiosity about relations and building that folklore. So the story is typically the people who have been in an organization for 20 years, they know what the big problems are, right? They've seen them and they've been exposed to them and they know the suffering associated with those problems. And so talking to the people who have been around for a long time, that's how I extract those stories out. And then figure out, okay, what if I did this small thing that's so inconsequential that you don't even think it's worth doing? But what if I did that? Right? And then like get some buy-in, right? get some, some social support from people who are a little more important to figure out is this of value or not? And then getting that buy-in is, is super helpful because then you can start saying, well, you know, I, I could actually do more if you let me. Um, I need some more resources like a, a computer um, you know, and some time to do that. So building the, the reputation, uh, but don't be scared of a big problem because <laughs> you're there, you've got nothing to lose. Like, what are they gonna do, demote you? <laughs> I mean, it's low risk, in my opinion. Other questions? That was good. I'll, I'll try and think of more advice, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I guess to back to your first question, like losing the curiosity and like being drained and feeling bad about things, that's where most people get stuck. Right? They're, they're, they're sort of jaded, they've tried things, they didn't work, and they give up. And that's where people stop. And so once someone loses the curiosity part about like what's the story and what are the variables going on, it's really hard to re-energize them because they're just, they've lost sight of the fact that they can make progress. All right, now I'm gonna describe my job to you and it's gonna sound really weird, all right? <laughs> I go to meetings, I work nine to five-ish, usually. Um, I read emails and I um, occasionally participate in meetings, even if I'm uh, not like, super excited. I write a lot of the documentation. Um, and then I have a lot of hallway meetings. So there, there's like formal meetings, usually they're like scheduled in blocks of an hour in a specific conference room. That's a type of meeting. There's another type of meeting which is informal. So, so who here is living in the real world has work experience? Okay, have you guys had hallway meetings? All the time, right? Those are like the social lubricant of your organization. Right? The, the formal meetings, those are cool, right? A lot of fun. No? No? Okay. Sorry. Uh, my meetings are fun. No. <laughs> so, but those informal meetings, that's where a lot of the value is delivered. Is that me? Not sure where that, here it is. Okay, 
So informal meetings are the social lubricant of an organization. And so those aren't structured. They're usually short. They're impromptu. And you know how they happen? You're walking around. Right? So, so they're almost always like, I'm walking to the microwave. I'm walking to the coffee maker. I'm walking to the supply room. And getting out of your seat is the trick. Because if you like happen to see someone in the hallway, you can have that spontaneous conversation. But if you're always at your desk working hard, you'll very rarely meet someone spontaneously. Right? Like you may, someone may come to your desk if you've got a lot of value, but typically they're not. And then way down at the bottom, right, this is like the writing code part. You've probably had a lot of that in this class, hopefully. But that's like a mm, less than 5% of the time. Right? So all that skill that you're building up, not that, that UMBC is a bad thing, right? Like UMBC is cool, but most of your time is going to be spent meetings and emails if you do data science, I think. So that sounds super boring, right? Like, oh my god, I'm an office worker. It's true. But it is a lot of fun. Like, occasionally you'll have like these huge like breakthroughs that are super exciting, and and they're totally worth it because they happen less than once a month. And then the rest of your time as an office worker is is sort of drudgery. So you gotta learn to live for those highs that last about five minutes. Yeah, and, and basically this is the psychology of slot machines. It's why slot machines are addictive. It's why data science is addictive for me. Um, so if you can find those and sort of like identify, oh, that's coming, that's cool. All right, yeah, so the positive, it, so who here works in government, anybody? Two, okay, so back me up on this or tell me I'm wrong, that's the question. So 40 hours per week, that's good, right? I don't have to work like 90 hours a week, that's good. Um, every so every pay period is two weeks, and then within that twenty is within that uh, two week period of eighty hours, I can have plus or minus twenty four hours. So that means I could work more than eighty hours one week, and then like hold that up and then like spend that the next week without using any vacation. Make any sense? So I don't have to use vacation to take off time, and I can work extra up to this sort of like flex of twenty four hours, and I get five weeks of vacation on top of that. Right? So if you're wise, you can take off a lot of time. I get health insurance. I have crazy job security. I can't be fired, basically, which is superb. I do a lot of crazy things. And I can change roles sort of at will, which is fun. Now, the bad side. <laughs> so the reason they give you all those perks is because life is very, very difficult. If your organization is old, which large organizations often, there's a lot of, we've done that this way all the time. Why would we ever change? It was like, uh, not very explicitly said, but almost implied in life. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so remember I was talking about finding that network of awesome people in, in your environment who are not local to you? Um, the other 95% of your workforce is not motivated, and they're not skilled. But oh, most of the organization makes progress, if you want to call it progress. I mean, like, it's it's... Almost embarrassing is how how little people get done in a day. Like they're mostly talking about sports, the weather, the kids, the porch they added on, all this other stuff. So it's it's. Tough. And then what's really weird to me is even though you can't get fired, there's often in a large organization very low times for risk, which to me makes absolutely no sense. Right? People don't want to take risk, even though they can't be fired, which is weird. And then there's always like legal stuff and lawyers running around and telling you you can't do things. Okay, so why am I, why do I think that you should be in this class? So given all of that sort of like fluff, um, it's because I think that organizations, especially important ones like in government, can make better decisions leveraging data science. That's my core tenet, I believe that. Because what I see is the alternatives are not as attractive. That these are just not cool. People flipping coins, I haven't seen that actually, right? But it's close enough where it's just like, oh yeah, we did it this way last time and it worked out not too bad because no one got killed, so we'll do that again. Right? So like trying to improve on that as a decision making process is pretty straightforward. You can use data science here. And then the bad news, right? So like I think we can improve, but often we don't. <laughs> um, so. There are data science-based arguments that one can make in a decision-making process. Those aren't always the winners. So there's lots of other alternatives that people make their basis on. Okay, so I'll wind up my little spiel here saying basically that um, 
you can use science. Often it doesn't get used because uh, there are other motives like making money. And sometimes it really is important to make it right, but often most businesses are not. So you won't often, uh, I know. Does anyone here work in the healthcare industry? Nobody. All right. So if you get into healthcare, um, sometimes it actually does matter what the decision is because someone's going to die. But most businesses are not like that. Unless you're like Tesla. All right. Yeah. So don't be afraid of failing, basically. All right. I think, oh yeah, this is one little last tidbit. <laughs> if you're excited about big data, I apologize. You will not be working with big data. It is most likely the case, right? You are not going to move on to Facebook. You're not going to move on to Google. You're going to be working for a small organization working with Excel spreadsheets. And if you're really lucky, an access database. Who has worked with an access database? Awesome. My old folks. <laughs> so access database right, or Excel spreadsheets because you don't have big data. You have small data that fits on one computer. And there's nothing wrong with that. People make decisions based on that data all the time. It's just not um, big data. So you're still going to have to face these same problems even though um, you don't have like a strong statistical basis, you can still do data analysis in support of it. All right. So do data science. Don't get cut off by budget. Right. I think I'm going to switch over to my other slide deck for actual real content, because all this was a rant, basically. I'm trying to like get you into thinking my way uh, quickly. All right. Look over to that. So now, <laughs> given all of the, the things I just told you about, like, you know, data science is hard, but it's not just technical. Now I'm going to transition over to the technical. So does anyone have any more soft questions or, like, political bureaucracy questions that I <laughs> will answer? All right. So we're going to do a little profiling tonight. Hopefully that's not a negative connotation in your mind. All right. <laughs> so hopefully you've been using Python. I hope Jared hasn't strayed too far from the path. All right, All right. so we're using Python. That's good. Um, and you'll hear a lot about other languages in data science, and those are cool, um, and they have their perks and their, and their benefits. But usually um, when we're looking for how to improve, it's best to start with what you have rather than saying, let's switch out to this new magical language that I read up on Slashdot because it's cool. So Switching is costly, and so we're going to try and stick with the tool that we have. OK, so the way that um, you can start that is you don't even have to have Python uh, running sort of as an isolated thing. You can even do it in Jupyter. So I'm not sure if J Jared has already showed this to you, but um, we're going to show you some magic commands in Jupyter that will allow you to time your cell execution uh, in Python. So I'm going to show you that profiling. Right. OK. So ha have you guys seen cell magics before? Is that a thing? No? Got some head nods? All right. So basically, think of Python as like this, this compiler that runs against these cell blocks. But you can ex there's sort of two things that you can escape out of a, uh, a cell. So let's do a quick. Like, all right, so if I do a exclamation point, what that exclamation point in a Jupyter Notebook does is it takes the following text and runs it on the computer rather than in Python. So even though it's a code cell, right, this is a cell uh, type code, it's running this command on my computer. And since I'm running a Mac, the command ls lists all the contents of the folder that I'm in. So if you're on a Windows, you could also type exclamation dir, and that would get back the list of files. So that's one type of escaping out of a shell. So that's not Python. The other one that we're going to look at tonight um, is these cell magics. And basically, the exclamation, uh, sorry, the, the percent sign here, that's a way of telling the IPython interpreter that looks at these cells to do something rather than like passing it off to a Python interpreter. So we're going to use these to time how long it takes to run code in a cell. Let's see if I can. Okay, so we're going to start fresh. So we have a fresh notebook. Okay, so now I'm going to have a 
a very complicated set of functions here. One that takes an input, multiplies it by two, adds one, and returns that value. Right? So that's cool. And then we have something that is almost uh, a prime uh, calculator. So a prime number is a number that can't be divided by anything besides itself and one. And so this function uh, is just something that costs some computational cycles. So don't worry too much about what the code does. It's just doing something that costs a lot of time. OK, so we've run that, got those functions loaded. And now I'm going to use our first magic command called time. So it's pretty straightforward. It times how long the execution of the next thing takes. And it just operates on a line basis. So we're going to call the function primes. And we're going to get the first 20 primes, I believe, and see how long that takes. All right, sorry, the, the primes up to 20. And so it took these uh, 75 microseconds. Uh, yeah, microseconds. So that's a that's a very small time. And then the other command that we can run, double ex double percent sign is going to calculate everything in the cell. So how long did that whole cell take? This is typically useful in my opinion. Obviously, it takes longer to run more calculations. So nothing too shocking there. The thing that might screw you up sometimes if you're outputting a lot to screen is this issue where it actually takes time to write the values to the screen. And that's not typically the part that we want to include in our profiling. Let's see if this is true. Awesome. All right. So it took us 75 microseconds to do the calculation and print the screen, whereas it took slightly less time for us to just uh, run the calculation and store the result to, the, to, the, to a variable. So it's slightly faster if we don't write to screen. So usually when you're benchmarking your code, seeing how long it takes to do certain things. Don't include the time it takes to write to screen. It's not the relevant part of the code. OK. Right. So it just take longer. Mm, I think that was all the magic I have for you. Right. And then the, the, the fancy part here. So before, we were using time. And the last part is using time it. And time it does the same thing, except it runs it multiple times, and then gives you sort of like how much variance there is in that uh, measurement. So if, that's, if that really is important to you, that's available. So all those were just for like running code and timing it. Now we're going to go off and do a little bit of a crazy land, because like just the fact that code took you a long time to run, that doesn't actually tell you very much. Right? The value of the, the timing might be to say, all of these cells are certain are taking a certain amount of time. Usually, you want to focus on the one that takes the most time. But sometimes looking at cell-based timing is not sufficient. You actually want to look at within a function how long are certain things taking. So, our first uh, profiler tool that we'll use is called C profile, and it basically takes um, the 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 code that you're running and breaks it into uh, the different calls within the code. So this isn't very readable because we're just looking at a code that's very simple. And so a lot of the time is looking at um, the function call time and the multiply by operation. So uh, a lot of calls there to multiply by because, not surprisingly, it's inside of a nested for loop. So we're doing this for loop a bunch of times. And then the multiply by operation gets called. And so you can sort of see it's getting called lots of times. Again, this shouldn't be exciting because we're looking at something that's super obvious. The value here is that when we have really complicated code and we don't know where to look, then this will identify the code that really matters. Okay. All right. Then the other, well, <laughs> this is a little trick here. If, if you don't know what the cell magics do, you can put a, X, a question mark after the end of them. And it'll actually give you the help for that, that doctrine. So. Line profiler, not too shockingly, should tell you about the profiling of each line of code. Whereas the previous one, C profile, that was just telling you about function calls. So here, again, we're using the, the multiply and the primes functions. Those tell you where to look in your set of function dependencies. But if you knew which function was taking a long time, you might ask, within that function, where is most of my time being spent? So this gets into a little more nitty gritty. It actually breaks out the entire function and tells you 
uh, how much time is being spent on each line. Now with this level of detail, you could actually take some action, right? You could change how this code is written to be more efficient in this very small section. Because typically, let's say I have like a thousand lines of Python, I don't want to have to rewrite the entire thing. You know, 90% of the time is being spent in this small section. I can focus my efforts on that small section of code. So that's where the value of this, what function is taking the most time, then within a function, which lines are taking the most time. Okay, now I know where to focus my optimization efforts. Okay, so for context, has anyone here optimized code that they've written before or someone else's code? Okay, so, so if no one's done that, why would we be doing that? Why would we, why do we invest time in making code run faster? You can shout it out when you know the answer. Okay, what's, what's large enough mean? <laughs> okay. So I'm laughing because I can, I can, with strong certainty, say the answer is absolutely not. We will always have to make computational trade-offs. So, so to be more specific, so back to your example of math was basically developed by hand for people calculating by hand. And we have actually gotten, well, uh, I'll stay away from the historical argument. So nowadays, we have this problem of do you do a lot of stuff in memory or do you do it on disk? Or do you compute it on the fly? Those are sort of like the trade-offs. Um, and so if you thought that your computer disk was the least expensive aspect of your computer, then you'd want to optimize your algorithm to use up a lot of disk space and not very much compute. Or if you thought the inverse of my computer can, can make calculations very quickly, and it takes a lot of sort of disk space, and the I.O. speed to the disk is very expensive, so therefore I'm going to optimize for compute. I'm not going to store as much on disk. Right? So that's like a really um, current thing to worry about. And so for an example of that, if I if I did all my calculations um, on a GPU versus CPU, that's another trade-off, right? So how much can how much time do you want to spend developing an algorithm that does things concurrently, right, in parallel? Versus how much time do you want to spend in an algorithm that does things serially on your CPU? And this is a trade-off that People have discovered recently that deep learning is really good at doing things uh, in parallel, and therefore, if you move it off, if you make the investment to rewrite all your code from C into CUDA, then you can get this huge speed up. Right? But that's only because the price point came down to do that parallelism much more cheaply than it used to be. So GPUs became cheaper, and therefore, everybody said, let's radically shift how all our algorithms work, and we'll rewrite it for the GPU, and we'll make that investment, it'll be faster and totally worth it. So these sorts of like trade-offs are impacted by technology choices, right? So like it, we didn't used to have really cheap GPUs, and therefore it, we made sense to do things in the CPU, right? Or maybe CPUs were really expensive and disk storage was not, and therefore we used to do things where everything would be given to disk very often, and very rarely you try and like do some calculations. So it's it's driven by I would say technology trade-offs as far as which algorithms will make the most sense to do it effectively. To answer the question? Yeah. Okay. And then Angela, to answer your question about like how big is big? If okay, question. <laughs> so there that, that gets to a sort of a separate question of like infrastructure trade offs. So like do I buy my own server or do I go do something in the cloud? Right? So let's say like it's really expensive for me to upgrade the servers that I have in my computer room. But I could go spend, you know, 20 bucks on Amazon and that get a much faster compute that is relatively quick to be responsive to my calculations there and get the data back. So there's sort of like 
in addition to these compute trade-offs, there's infrastructure trade-offs. That's another sort of like hot topic right now of like, do you move to cloud? Do you have self-hosted infrastructure? Do you buy your own, right? Like all these sorts of questions. So that's another set of trade-offs. Yeah, fun. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so how flexible is your code to new problems, basically? Right, so, so you're saying another motive to make trade-offs in your algorithmic approach is the use case model for the resources you have access to. Yeah, so there's lots of good motivations to, to, to make trade-offs. And then what I was going to add on to that is the, uh, <laughs> the question of like how impatient are you is sort of a factor to also include. So like if it, so standard measure in, in school is like if I can go get a cup of coffee and come back and have the calculation done, it's good enough for me. Right? Like I don't need it to be faster than that. But maybe if it takes, like let's say you're working on some degree and it takes, you know, a few months to do a calculation. Well, in that case, you probably don't want to be patient enough to see when your program crashes, you know, three weeks into it. And so, you know, how impatient you are and, and what is driving you. So you'll have some timelines that you need to meet. And so, um, here, the question of do I want how much investment do I make to make the code faster versus how long is it taking me to get the, the answer in the first place with this crappy in implementation? If you can answer that sort of trade-off, that's that's the question of like do I need to invest or not? Um, so typically, what we see is like if it takes more than a day or so, you want to start thinking about um, rewrite rewriting some part of your code because that day is going to be spent waiting for your code to finish. You could wait a day and have do you know something else, or you could take that time that you're waiting for your code to run and figure out how to run your code faster. So for me, like the first trade-off is on the order of a day. If it takes more than 24 hours to run your code, you should start thinking about making it faster. The other thing to think about is how often is this code gonna run? If the code runs once and it takes three hours, fine, right? I can wait three hours, I'm a patient guy. Or is it gonna run for five minutes, but it's gonna run 10,000 times, right? And that may be like on a smartphone app, if I'm running some smartphone app and it takes five minutes to do something, that seems like a long time, especially when I have 10,000 users, right? and each one of them is doing five minutes. And so if you can figure out what is the total computational cost, not just like how long one run takes, right? but if you have a many runs that are short, then it might also still be worth uh, investing in optimization. All right, so we covered a lot of topics. Right, let's, I'm gonna take notes, so. So we did uh, compute versus storage. Uh, Len, what was the, the one that you had was flexibility. flexibility. Okay, and then Angela's was how big is it or how long is it? Yeah. Uh, And then the last one that I was saying is the uh, total duration or cumulative duration. So either like greater than a day, I might start thinking about optimizing it. So those are sort of my thresholds. If, you're t if your calculation takes like microseconds, typically not gonna be worth optimizing. Again, unless it runs 10 million times, in which case the total duration is actually pretty long. So let's read this a little bit. So we've got our function. That, let's, I'm going to scroll back up to the code that we did this with. All right. So LP run line profiler. So we're looking now at the function. We're going to call the primes function, and we're going to pass in an argument where it's going to get the primes up to 10,000. And then the, the function that we're actually going to profile is the dash f primes. So we're, we're telling it, run this command. But when you run that command, just look at this one function and profile that. 
And so what it returns back is, I think I have all the count. Right. So I can't get all that quite on the screen, but hits is basically the number of times that a thing was called. So if you look at that, you've got two nested for loops, and the thing in the innermost loop is being called the most times. That's almost always the case in computational code, is that you have nested for loops. The innermost code is where you're going to spend most of your time. Therefore, it becomes very important to get right. And then you can say uh, percentage of time. It's another easy sort of like spending most of its time there. OK. Yeah, that's all I got. All right. So uh, I think when I'm teaching my class, the homework for this class is to go back and reevaluate your old notebooks and see whether there's anything optimized. So if you look through all your old notebooks and you figure out what the timing on all those cells was, where would you spend the most time opting code? I will not be assigning that to you, but I mean, we're thinking about. OK, so then the question becomes, now I've, I've found where most of the time is being spent. Oh, let's take a break. So I'll come back to this section at 7.57. How's that? Or 7.58. So you're on break. All right. Yes, yes. I will write that down. Let's see.
All right, so uh, I'll get started to everybody's back. Uh, so this is this this notebook here has like a fun history to it. So my girlfriend's in the medical community, and she works with a research team. Uh, and so one day, I, uh, we had we had, so she doesn't work locally. She works uh, with a set of collaborators in another state. So I had flown along with her just to sort of tag along and you know work out of the hotel. But then she brought me along to the lab. And this one person was talking about the problem that he had, and I was happy to be there for the day, sort of on my own spare time. And so I said, "Hey, I could help, maybe, right? At least, like, let me look at what you're doing." And so he showed me a problem that he had, and this notebook was me trying to diagnose what went wrong and how to fix it. So this is this is not some abstract problem that I came up with. This is me running around uh, in real life. So I'm not going to run this notebook live because it takes about two minutes to execute. So it's a long notebook. The, the main story here that we're going to look at is this function that I had been provided. It, like the actual thing that it does is practically irrelevant to you other than it takes a long time. Right? That's, that's the main problem. This code that someone else wrote called sample entropy takes some arguments. In, in some sense, we don't care what they are. Um, and then it does a bunch of calculations, and it returns a single number. Great, right? Someone else, this is, this is so right, data science is about domain expertise, some programming skills, and some math skills. So this right here, what I'm showing you is the domain expertise that I almost don't care about, right? The only part that's relevant is to say it's a Python function that takes some inputs and produces some outputs. Now, as we sort of foreshadowed, it's computationally expensive, and it has these for loops in it. Huh, we've seen those before, right? Those are like our arch nemesis, the for loop. Um, so especially when you have these nested for loops, you almost know in advance that the, the, the most of the time in this code is going to be spent in the inside of the loop, right? But these are pretty simple. Like it's doing some, some array operations, and so there's not a lot to optimize here. So although we know that the code is going to be spending a lot of time here, it doesn't look like there's a lot to do. So so we're going to actually have to use some Python tools to figure out what can, what can we do to make this code faster. And the problem was, um, I think by the person who I was talking to, his estimate was that it would take more than a year to run the calculation. For the input that he was using, um, this would take a long time. Because he was looking at a huge data set. And I was just like, that is not acceptable. We will get your code faster. I will work on it today. See what we can do. OK, so then outside of these four loops, We've got some initializations with uh, NumPy, and we've got some other stuff going on, again, outside the loop, uh, so that happens. OK. So uh, we're going to look at function profiling. This is, again, uh, a magic command. Scroll down all the way past that. So let's, let's look at this function gets called. And because you're only calling one function, most of the time is being spent in that function. Let's see if we can show that right here. So, so the name of the function, it gets called a bunch of times. So like we initialize an array, we initialize that array up there, and then we run that function with the array that we calculated. And then surprise, surprise, it gets called a bunch of times. So again, this isn't super useful, but eventually if you look at more functions that depend on functions, it'll be relevant. But I'm going to practically skip over that. All right, the line profiler. This is what we looked at before, and this is where the gold is, right? So again, LP run, and then we pass it the thing that we want to profile, which is the only thing that we're running, and we're going to pass it some arguments. So let's see how long each of these lines take. All right, so again, let's see, the column where, so percent time, number of hits, these are the sort of things that we're going to look at. So let's look at percent time. 10% 10 10 is spent up here in this uh, addition operation. We've got this 16% up here. So we've got quite a bit of time spent not just in the core of the loop, the core of this nested for loop. There's actually not a lot of time being spent there. There's more time being spent up here for some reason. All right, and then what's on here? So we've got another 26% of the time being spent down in this, this uh, array assignment for some reason. So this, this for loop is also pretty expensive, even though it's just nested twice, whereas this one's nested three times. So that's sort of weird. There's more time being spent 
uh, outside of the nested for loop than inside the for loop. So that's that was a little misleading to think that this was going to be the expensive part. It turns out that these are also expensive. Question. Uh, question. Well, so that that inner column that I was looking at that was percent time. The answer for time, I don't think that says it here. Let me see if I can go. I might be able to answer that quickly. If I, yeah, yeah. It's a reasonable question. I think down here we had line time. Uh, it says total amount of time being spent no, in the timer's units. <laughs> I got nothing on that one then. All right. So, so the, this is a little bit weird, but it's sort of like my experience. So like this function, um, the reason I was able to run this line profiling is because I did not, in fact, feed you know, the, the actual data size that this person was caring about. Like he cared about something where it was like he was going to feed it uh, uh, an array of size 10 million or something. And I didn't want to wait a year to see what the profiling would show. So I fed the function a much smaller array. This array was only of size 100, which is why I was able to run the profiling in a reasonable amount of time. So it's like trick number one. But my question was, how did he arrive at that calculation that it would take a year, right? That's a long time to run a calculation. And I knew he hadn't actually run it. So I went back, um, and in addition to profiling how this function runs and where it spends the most time, I wanted to see how it would grow. This is a critical question. How does your function scale as the data size increases. This is where um, we'll come. We'll get to the punchline, and then I'll get you how I got there. Uh oh, I may have to actually run this notebook. Let's see. All right. Well, we'll get to the punchline. Hopefully, there's a plot at some point. Mm, nope. Looks like I I goofed on myself. All right. So I will have to, while I'm waiting for the plot to render, I'll tell you what I did. Basically, what I'm going to do is change the size of the input. So I've got an array of size 100. That's what I had previously profiled for. So I knew it could run pretty quickly. And then I wanted to say, how long will it take if I run the code uh, with an input size of array 100? And it will take 0 0.02 seconds. And if I do that again, it'll take 0 0.3 seconds, and then 0 0.2 seconds, right? And so like you can see a little bit of variation here, for, but for the most part, the amount of time that it takes to run with a given input size is relatively stable. That's this outer loop here. And then I'm going to rerun the same the same code, but for a larger input size. So now I've increased it by a factor of uh, 10. And now it's taking 2.4 seconds, and 2.4 seconds, and 2.4 seconds. So again, pretty stable within a given input size, but uh, much more than a 10x increase in the amount of time it took to calculate, right? So here we went from 0 0.02 to 2.4. So that's more than a 100x increase for a 10x input size increase. That's why it's going to take so long, right? For when we go to like 100 million as an input size, this is going to take a really long time, right? All right? So now I've done a few calculations for increasing amounts of input size. And this is how I got to the original, to the estimation of how long it would take for like a hundred million size input. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, man. All right. Oh, there we go. That's what I screwed up. Super. One of the, okay. So this was the punchline basically. So for a given input array size, we can see that these values are increasing in the amount of time that they take. And so therefore, I can fit a line to that set of three points. And obviously, you know, you'd actually want to go out a few more points to be a little bit more rigorous. I think in my original function, I did like a size input size 1,000 and 10,000. But those take a long, much longer time. Yeah, question. Good, OK. So I will come to that. So just to reiterate, we did a couple different input sizes. We did multiple tests for each input size. And then we figured out how long that calculation took for given input size. This is forming my uh, x and y axes for that plot. And you'd want to do it more than just three, but that was good enough for this example. All right, then I set up my yes. All right, so this is a NumPy poly 1D. So basically, I happen to know that from enough data points that this was going to scale as a polynomial function of order two. 
right? So x, something x squared plus something x plus another thing. Those three coefficients, those were what I wanted to calculate using this poly 1D. And then once I knew those, I could fill in basically uh, a new, so I had my original data points, my, my three data point experiments that I did, and then I could uh, fill in uh, a larger range. So you're on all these orange points, that's just uh, this Lin space fills in all the values between uh, 0 and 10,000 at step 50. And then I apply that set of x values to the function that I'm showing up here. So now I've fit a polynomial to the three data points that I have from the experiment that I did. So a little bit of uh, NumPy wizardry. Good question. All right, so basically, this leads me to believe that his calculation, that it would take more than a year to do the full size calculation, is correct. So now, like, why did I waste my time doing that, right? Because I actually wanted to figure out, is it worth optimizing this code the way he said it should be, or would I just be wasting my time? Right? I wanted to make sure that actually, if you run this at scale, it will really be painful. So therefore, it really is worth the investment to optimize the code. Right? So it's like me trying to evaluate whether his claim that we should do this was valid. All right, I suspect yeah, none of this other code's gonna run. All right, so if we look back at the, the line profiling that we had done, which I think is now gone. Sorry, Matt. <laughs> that one mistake in the code is killing me here. There we go. Once that finishes. So there's a for loop, and have you guys talked about lambda functions yet? Uh, so not lambda functions, or I have to remind myself. Yeah, so we can basically, uh, is it, maybe I'm misstating, maybe a list, comp there we go. It's a list comprehension. Phew. <laughs> All right, so there is a list comprehension, not a lambda. In this code, here we go. All right. We not on this? <laughs> All right, live demos are always exciting, but there is a, if you recall back, there was some for loops that were being run that were taking up like 20 26% of the time. And so my, my simple trick was to figure out for one of those for loops, could we rewrite it as a list comprehension? And that might be faster. So I apologize, I don't know why my notebook is not cooperating tonight. But basically what we did was we changed this for loop where we're spending about 26% of our time into a single list comprehension. I will note that here. And so my goal was maybe that list comprehension would be faster than the for loop. But these, the sad punchline here is that that list comprehension, oh my goodness, is not having a good night tonight. All right, well, that, ra that ran again. <laughs> All right, F lambda. Mm. Oh, there we go. There we go. All right. So I rewrote the code to be a little bit faster in one of the hot spots that I thought would take a bunch of time, but it turns out that that didn't actually improve the time. So here I went from 0 0.02 seconds to 0.7 seconds at about the same times as before. Uh, so it's not actually that much of an improvement to replace that for loop. So I was sad. I had tried something that I thought might work and did not. Let's see. So the, uh, I don't even have color on here. So I think it's slightly faster to go with the lambda, but not significantly. It wouldn't change how that works. All right. I might have to come back to this after break. So my rule of thumb is if I have three mistakes in one notebook, it's time to stop using the notebook. Uh, but I'm trying to get to the punchline here. But the punchline is there is a library called Numba. So Numba is a in time compiler. And so it takes your Python code and refactors it into machine code, which runs way faster. 
So it's not being compiled line by line. It's being translated into machine code and then run as an executable, which is way faster. And so the awesome thing about Numba, which is basically I'm, I'm a walking advertisement for it, is that take your original function, so it's everything that was written before, and then you add one line. And so basically this is called the decorator. Things that start with an at symbol that occurred just before a function are called decorators. So you decorate your function with a call to Numba, and you say, hey, Numba, when the time goes to interpret this function, actually just rewrite it as machine code and then execute it. Um, and so it turns out that there's a bunch of arguments being passed there that basically say, take advantage of parallelism. So your computer has multiple cores. Take advantage of that. And it turns out that this is way faster, which is cool, because it's super lazy, right? I literally changed one line of code by adding a decorator, and that one optimization happens to speed up my code by something like 10x. Again, I'll come back to this uh, once this is running, because I'll have to do it over break. And we'll see that the, the runtime with compiling the code rather than having it as uh, Python is much faster. OK, it seems to not be very happy tonight. There we go. Finished, finished. Let's see if it gets stuck one more time. Awesome. OK. So now let's see. we reran the code. I feel like it's faster. Yes, there we go. So there's the punchline. Why is it taking that long? I don't know. So now we're rerunning at a input, same input size of 100 and 1,000, but now we can go up to 10,000 much more rapidly. I don't know why. So input size under taking seven seconds, there's something wrong there. But the goal here is that uh, the, the execution for a larger input size is way faster, just with one line of code change. That makes me happy. This is going to work, probably. What I go up to? Oh, 10,000. That'll take a long time to finish out, so we'll come back to that later. But then we're happy. All right, so in the end, the new input size uh, for or the new calculation for his code was going to take eight days rather than a year. So that's my advertisement for number. <laughs> and we'll have a working notebook by the end of it tonight. All right. All right. Time for you guys to get some exercise. Uh, so <laughs> we're going to talk about your. I mentioned in number that you can use multiple cores on your laptop. So if that's news to you, awesome. I delivered some value. Most of what you've been doing so far in the 601 class has been on a single processor. You write code, it executes linearly, sequentially, and you're done. And you're not, it, it allows you to think about your problem pretty easily. So there's a little bit of cognitive overhead when we start using multiple things at once. I'm going to define two words. You'll often hear people use the word parallel to mean things happening at the same time. And that is a true statement. But I need a little bit of nuance. So I'm going to introduce the word concurrent. And so concurrent really means that there are things happening at the same time, and there's no communication between them. Whereas for me, when I say parallel, I mean things are happening at the same time, and those things are communicating. Okay, those are two distinct situations. Concurrency is way easier. It basically says there's no coordination required between the things that are happening at the same time. That's, that's usually where you want to start out with. And that's where we'll spend uh, our focus tonight. All right. The reason that this, even though it's harder to think about programming things concurrently or in parallel, it's usually worth it. Because your computer already has multiple cores. So the financial cost, right, the time of like how much money do I need to spend uh, is, is nothing. You already have the resources. So why not take advantage of them, right? If, if parallelism and concurrency is free, Definitely take advantage. And usually it's just a little bit of thinking in your in change of thinking. And you have to be a skilled programmer. All right. So if you're on Windows, I want you to open up Task Manager. And if you're on a Mac, I want you to open up Activity Manager. All right. So th there's a whole, <laughs> I look, I know, there's like six, six seven, se at least seven different ways of opening Task Manager. And my question for you is, do you see something like this or something else? I think on, yeah, on, uh, on, on Mac, I'll come back to the Windows slide, but if you're on a Mac, 
open up the Activity Manager, and I'll be wandering around to help you out. If you're on the Activity Manager, then open up Window and CPU History, and you'll see something that looks like this. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna wander around and see how people are doing, because I actually want you to like see on your computer that it has multiple processing cores. This is Windows 10, right? Yeah. Not sure how to show. Like a view? No. Okay. Who, who, does anyone have Windows 10 and know how to get to the multi-core view? All right, everybody's running Windows 10. <laughs> Hey, how did you get to it? Ah. Okay. Open resource monitor. There we go. Thank you. If you go down here. There you go. All right. Yeah, their window. And then uh, CPU history. Yep. Okay. So who here has more than two processing cores? Okay, the people who have not raised their hands, you have two processing cores or less? Yes? So there's four windows that you got four. Uh, or no, no, no. Nine. No, that's CPUs. Okay, that's two cores. All right. Awesome. <laughs> All right. So we found a couple of people have two. Awesome. Okay. So now we're going to pair up. There's uh, 19 of us who will form two groups, uh, sorry, nine groups of two. So cut off by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, one. All right, so there should be, a, you have to physically get up. <laughs> and then the ones correlate. And the twos get together, and the threes find each other. <laughs> At least one person from each group will need to move. Okay, so basically, I got you started. Now you can answer these questions. Okay, so hopefully you're working your way through answering these questions. If both of you don't know how to answer one of the questions, raise your hand and I can come over. I used to work in IT. Thank you. 
Uh, you can you can have two independent measurements. Question. Yes. We're both looking at the disk panel. Okay. Um, are we looking at data read, data written? Uh, that's good or question. Yes. Yeah. Is that? Uh, I'm gonna. Op I would suggest opening up the terminal there, that black okay. little window, yeah. and then type uh, df space dash h dash h. Yep. Okay. And if you make that a little bit bigger, it'll be easier to read. Okay. So on your computer. You have a 120 gigabyte drive, and you're using 100 gigabytes of it, and mm -hmm. you have 11 free. Okay. Does that sound right? Yeah. Okay. So that's how much disk space you're using. Yep. Yes. On a Mac? Windows. Okay, so if you open up the Windows Explorer, so like hold down the Windows key and press E. Yep, okay. And then click on this PC. Yeah, so that's oh. the, you have a 212 gigabyte disk and you're using some amount there. And for Mac, you have a two terabyte drive and you're using 130 gigabyte, 139 gigabytes of it. Yep. Question? How much of your network are you using now? Yeah, so like the the rate here is like you're using 20-ish kilobytes per second at most, and you probably have like a five megabyte network connection. So small percent. Okay. <laughs> okay. So we're gonna do a quick survey, but before we do the survey, I'm gonna tell you why this is of relevance. So. Suppose you have a boss. Your boss is named Bob, right? Because I love common names. So Bob is the person that you have to go to to ask for more computers, right? So you go to Bob. Hey Bob, uh, can I get another computer? And Bob's like, uh, we don't have the budget for it, and I can't afford it, so no. And you say, uh, but I really need one. And he's like, that's not a good argument. You're a data scientist. What's the numbers, right? Tell me how much of your computer you're using. Right. And so you, as a data scientist, will need to know enough about your computer to understand how much of your compute resource currently are you using. Because if you're using a small percentage of your disk and your memory and your CPU and your network, you're going to have a really hard time justifying the need for additional computers. But if you told Bob, hey, Bob, you know, for the past two months, we've been running these calculations, and they used up all of our CPU, and they used up 80% of our network, and we've saturated our disk, uh, or we saturated our network connectivity. We need more compute. But that's a much, much stronger argument. Right? And then you can say the ROI, the return on investment, if you buy the computer, is this much, right? So you can sort of play the games of this is how much it impact of the business it will make, and you've quantified on the front end how much you're using now. And what you really want to be able to say is, 
We're using this much to solve this problem right now. But in order to solve the really big problem, we need this much compute. So you need to be able to have that extrapolation skill to say, I can run my problem on one computer now and it takes 10 days, but if we had 10 computers, it would take one day. And the impact to the business is that. And so that's the sort of story you want to be able to tell to a decision maker, and then they can f make the fight about how much money to spend on your investment. So that's why all of this is relevant. So although this doesn't feel like data science, it's going to be the arguments that you use to get the resources you need to do the data science. All right, so show of hands, who is using more than 1% of their CPU on average while they've been looking at it? Okay, so all, right? Who here has been using more than 50% of their CPU on average? Nobody, all right. So this is like a, a pretty standard response. You're using something, but you're not using most of what you have. So the consequence here is you could potentially double the amount of things that you're doing on your computer right now, and you still wouldn't notice, which is great. Okay, memory. Who is using more than 1% of their memory? Everybody, right? All. And I'd say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a, this isn't bad in forecasting, at least 10% of the people are using more than 50% of their memory. Who here is using more than 50% of the memory? Okay, so maybe like 80 to 90, I'll say. Okay, and then like, we'll say the same thing for disks. So who's here using more than 50% of their storage capacity? Ah, three, all right, not very many. So the disk, why is this? The disk is cheap. You buy a really big disk and you never fill it up. That is the standard story of today. And network, who here is using more than 10%? Nobody. That's because we don't move files around very much, right? We typically like <laughs> send emails and then tell you to go get it from this location. But like data movement is a relatively rare operation. That's different than if you're in the cloud, but for you, you're on your laptop, you have your Excel spreadsheet, the data almost never leaves your notebook. Therefore, network is one of the most rarely used ones if you're doing local computations. But if you're in the cloud, it becomes a much bigger factor. Okay, so I'm not gonna fill in this whole chart, but Basically, these are the skills that you'll need to be able to make quantitative arguments about the resources you're using in order to get more resources if you need them, and you need to know how much more resources you need. Okay, you can go back to your desk. Okay, so as I mentioned, Python by default is serial. The operations happen sequentially, and it makes it much easier to reason about. But as we've also showed, your computer has a bunch of cores on it. So this is what an actual you know, picture of hardware looks like. So the goal here is for you to figure out how can I utilize those extra resources on my computer so I can do my calculations faster, but not working too hard, right? Like you don't wanna spend all of your time optimizing and, and parallelizing your code. That's not really the goal. Okay, so it happens that turn out that there is a library in Python called multiprocessing. So I'm not, I, <laughs> this is totally not an advertisement that you should make your code use multiprocessing all the time. It's more of an advocate, I'm advocating for the fact that you should have this in your mind so that if someone comes to you and says, I need to make this code faster on my laptop, this is available. Right. This is the, the use case, but you definitely not want to turn to this as a first go-to. You want to optimize your code, make sure it runs fast serially. Then, if needed, then you go to multiprocessing. The reason I'm saying that this is a last resort in some sense is because it makes troubleshooting your code way harder. Right? It's harder to reason about what is the code doing when there's a bunch of things going on at the same time. Because if one of those things errors out or has some bug in it, Troubleshooting out what happened at, in that instance is way tougher. So I'm going to take you on a quick tour of multiprocessing. It's more for you to have in your mental model of toolkit of things to, to include um, when solving problems, not as a go-to. Kind of along the same lines as number. Like, number is cool if it works. If it doesn't, don't worry about it.
So we're going to go <laughs> diving down into the deep recesses of your computer, and it might get a little boring. So I'm probably not going to spend a ton of time on this, but it's, it's going to allow you to hopefully get um, a little bit of fluency with the words that are useful. OK, when your computer runs a program, it is assigned a process ID. So this is a number. So like you may see that you're running a Jupyter Notebook, but your computer doesn't care that it's a Jupyter Notebook. All it sees is there's a number associated with this thing that is executing. And so that process ID, you can figure out from Python what the current process ID is. Um, and that's just OS get PID. So that's cool. And then usually what happens is you'll have a process that creates a new process. And that's called the child, right? And the child has a parent. And so you can figure out what process caused your process to come into existence. So it gets a little naughty to keep track of, but this is some Python functions to figure out what's going on. Let's restart this notebook. So, da, 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 da. right. So I can. This is just me using those functions. I can figure out what my process ID is. It's not too exciting. Don't worry about it. It's just to say that those things are doable. Now we get off into the crazy land, right? So I am a process, and I want to create a new process in Python. How do I do that? Well, so let's use this thing called process right here. And that came from, let's see, I imported multiprocessing. That was the library. And I imported a module called process. So not too shocking yet, right? <laughs> so I'm using the multiprocessing library to create a new process. And basically, I'm not going to walk through this. It'll be available for you later. But basically, this is to say that in the cell that I'm running, I can create a new process. And then that process exists. So let's see, originally here, my process ID is 211, and I use this processing code. I started the process, and my process ID is now 229. So pretty exciting. You can create low-level processes using Python. Amazing. All right. Why would I care about that? Well, the real reason you care about that is if you were one process and you were to spawn at Yes. Yeah, so they are managed by the IPython in, in infrastructure, and then that closes down, and your Python environment's gone. Yeah, good question. The reason that we care about creating processes is that is what multiprocessing is doing. So if your computer has fours, and you started up four processes that were all independent, then you could go off and do computations on those four separate cores and do things um, separately on the, on the hardware, and then come back and figure out what the answer is. So this is an example. So has, has Jared covered map before? OK, no. All right, so <laughs> I'm tempted to wander off. I'm going to do a little bit of, well, <laughs> on, on the off chance that that was the case, I had a notebook work. OK, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go off on another rabbit hole. Now we've, we've left the multiprocessing library, and we're changing libraries. All right, so in Python, I often have a thing called a list. And lists are handy because they have lots of data in them. And so if I wanted to do an operation on each element of that list, the standard way that we we're taught to do that is using a for loop. Right? So it's like for the element in the list, do the thing, do the thing, do the thing, do the thing. Right? That's very normal. But there's this handy thing called map. So I, I write a function, and I apply that function to the list. So that's the idea of map. So the, the thing is, you have to create these helper functions, whereas when we were using for loops, we just did the thing. right? Like the body of the for loop is the thing that we want to apply to the list. So it's a little change in mindset. You have to figure out, what's the function that I want to apply? In this case, it's the squaring operation. So I'm going to write a really small function that does that, and then I'm going to apply that function to each element in the list. OK, so it's it's a little bit different. It's a little bit uh, crazy to think about, because like here, you can sort of reason through the fact that you're stepping iterations. Map just says, go do it. Right? There's no concept of a for loop or iterations. And you might sort of like figure out, oh, that's helpful. Right? So I'll, I'll just say that there are other things like map, so like filter and reduce and there's apply right, for pandas. So all of these things, they're, they're sort of a functional approach. They say, like, 
here's an input, do a function to it, and then you're going to get some output. So the utility of that is if you're using a thing like map, and you say, apply this function to the elements of the list, there's nothing that requires coordination among those iterations of the loop, right? If you wrote this as a loop, each iteration of the loop is independent. If you write it as a map function, you're just applying this to this element, and this element, and this element, right? Is it faster than Right, so that's the question. So if you're doing it serially, I think my guess, I haven't timed this, but my guess is doing the, the operation, like calling this function against each element of this loop in a for loop would be more expensive because you have to call out to that function. So there's some overhead to be paid there. But um, if you do this with map, in a serial sense, there's no, it's not a, there's no advantage. Okay. Uh, what's the I don't know the answer to that one. Not a computer science person. Sorry. <laughs> so yeah, your big O notation. I don't know what the answer is. So the valid, that the advantage of map here is that there's nothing about the loops, and so each one of these things can be applied independently, which means you can spread them out among the different processors. So if I had a really long list, the map function is going to be applied to as many processes as I have available, and that's where I get the speed up. So it's not that map is faster than a for loop in a serial sense. It's that I can take the map function and apply that concurrently among all my operations independently. Does that make sense? So who, who here is lost so far? Question. Um, in place of defining the square function, you could do the lambda. Yes. A uh, superb question. I will write that. I don't have an answer for that, and I know that I can't code that up quickly enough. But uh, we, we could basically like time how long this operation takes with a function and a lambda, and see what the di timing difference is. I don't know the answer. But I, yeah, that's what I was saying. Right. So like here, you have to like leave the for loop iteration that you're in, go to this, and pass the data to it, and then come back to the for loop. So I think calling out to the function will be more expensive, but I don't know, like, at what, so I think, uh, yeah, so later on in, in a later notebook, I basically make the point that if you're doing really small things, none of this matters. And it only starts to matter when your input sizes grow to be very large, where that trade-off becomes noticeable. So we will almost never see it at this scale, but a reasonable question. Thank you. All right, I don't have time. So, so to reiterate, basically, we're applying this function to each of these elements, and we can do that concurrently when we make those multiple resources available on our computer. Okay. That was the, the delivery point there. OK, so now I'm going to get back to the, the small data problem. So I'm going to take this, this data frame, and I want to do a thing to it, right? So like, this is actually of a size 100, so I'm just showing the first few elements here. Hopefully that's not too scary. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I want to split that data frame into multiple pieces. Um, and so I'm going to have to have a splitter. So I, I take that array, and I split it into some number of chunks. And then I can apply the function that I want, whatever the function is, to each of the chunks. And then I can concatenate all those things back. Does that make sense? We've got like a, a, and a data frame of size 100. I split it into multiple chunks. I apply my operation to each of the chunks independently. And then I'm going to take them all and put them back together. Questions on that? This is, this is the, I'm, t I'm telling you the plan. Right? This is the crazy, crazy plan that we're going to actually use concurrency to do a pandas operation on a data frame. And the really exciting operation that we're going to apply to this is we're just going to multiply all the elements by 2 uh, in column A. So you know, this isn't a computationally expensive thing, but just to say we did something. And so we're going to parallelize uh, the operation where we take column A and multiply it by 2 to get a new column. 
so there is there's my operate there's my data frame beforehand, and then afterwards uh, I was hoping that I show this. Ah, I'm sad I didn't actually show the output. Anyway, so when I uh, so when I do the the parallel uh, now I'm confused. Oh, I should write yeah, modified. That's right. But I don't have this set here anymore. All right, so the parallelized data frame operation, that splitting took 406 milliseconds, whereas if I had just done the operation serially, so I apply the operation to each element of uh, the column A, that only took 21 milliseconds. So something went terribly wrong here, right? We, we made it parallel, or we made it, sorry, concurrent, and it should run way faster, but if we did it in serial, it took uh, was that 200, uh, 20 times less. Super weird, right? <laughs> okay, so what's going on? The problem is that when we take all of the data and we split it across all these different threads and we put it on these different cores and then we do the operation and we get it all back, all of that overhead, the time that it took to distribute the data, apply the operation and get the data back, is actually more expensive than just doing it serially. This is a pretty standard result. Like when you first try to go to apply a concurrent operation to your data, if your data is too small, you will see a negative gain. That's, that's bad. So again, this only works when you're operating on large data, okay, which I don't have here. But all right. So I think that's all I have for, for this notebook. Basically, <laughs> avoid applying concurrency if your data is too small. That one. Okay, we got that. Right. So if you thought multiprocessing was like a deep dive and super like tough and technical, you just got started. There's another library called Dask, which not as many people have heard of, and that's because they're not running clouds. So multiprocessing is popular because you can run it on your desktop, but you can only run it on your desktop. So that becomes a, pro a, a problem for multiprocessing. Because if we have a bunch of computers, and we want to take advantage of all of them, then multiprocessing is not going to be sufficient. And we have to use a thing called Dask. OK, so the way to think about it, the trick is it's coordinating a bunch of pandas operations across different computers. That's all Dask is. So if you have a bunch of computers and you're doing something really big, Dask might be a reasonable way of doing that. And the value is for Dask is if you're coming from pandas, the syntax is effectively very similar. So you barely have to learn anything new. So here's a read CSV in, so DD is the common uh, abbreviation there for Dask. Yeah. Oops, skip over one. All right, I think I'm gonna, let's see, how much time do we got? Yeah, so we'll do uh, this quick Dask demo and then we'll take a quick break and we'll come back for the third section. So we'll show Dask. Dask is even slower than multiprocessing. So that's sort of like the, the punchline of this coming notebook here, is that I'm going to show you Dask. It's going to underperform compared to everything else. I'm going to skip all the way to the, the punchline here. Get to the punchline. Right. So this is where we're going. So I, I compare uh, a certain implementation for something in Dask, which is this top pink line, to uh, an operation that's serial, which is uh, almost as fat, or almost as uh, slow, I should say, I guess. And then like the Dask is slow, uh, and then Lambda is really fast. So like doing a Lambda operation is quick. And the reason is because we have a relatively small data frame, and so you don't actually get any performance improvement, because you're paying all this overhead to distribute the data and then collect it back. So that's the sad punchline. But hopefully, if you're to run this on a large data set on many computers, you'd actually see a performance gain. All right. So, right, it's the same uh, data frame that we've played with previously. Of it's now a thousand rows in the four columns. And we're going to basically distribute that same operation rather than using multiprocessing. We'll use Dask and we'll partition it over to four chunks. I have four CPUs. And then I can double that uh, column for a given partition in Dask. 
And then again, this is slightly more complicated, but basically this is that same map operation. We're applying the functions to each of the chunks in every uh, pandas data frame. There's a lot of sort of mm, Dask specific stuff here, but coming from pandas, and if you know map, it's somewhat readable. Okay, so then I saved off all my results from the other notebook as far as uh, serial and applying pool. And I go off and test that out, and that's where the, the result here comes from, is basically I'm plotting all of the results from each of the different approaches and applying that poly1d fit now for just a linear extrapolation, and that's where the plot comes from. So that's the, the quick punchline for that. Okay, and now we're on break again. Whew. So we'll come back at, let's see, eight minutes, eight for AFG 56. Let's see.
So Camille, to answer your question about passing a lambda function, uh, multiprocessing cannot take that lambda function and spread it out over the other processes. I don't understand why, but uh, basically there was some some hackery needed. Not that one. It's a Stack Overflow question about how to let it take a lambda function. So it says no. I don't understand why not. Now I'm kind of curious whether that works in the map. So the map function takes a lambda. Let's see. say they're equal <laughs> I don't get there's a like a larger variance for the lambda that's weird Is everybody back? Yeah. Okay. So the you will probably not be exposed to Dask unless you actually have cluster resources that someone else is managing for you. And if you're the data scientist who is creating the cluster, that's like a whole different topic, right? So like, if you have to stand up something with multiple processes and put a schedule on it and then enable Dask, that's more system administration. So we're not going to get into that. But so like someone else has set up a cluster for you, and then you could use Dask. OK, so th to reiterate, all of this is basically the takeaway is you have a computer. It has multiple cores. If you can, and it's relatively easy, then you should definitely leverage those before asking someone for more resources. But once you need to move on, there are other resources available that allow you to work with larger <laughs> compute clusters and larger data um, and still let you stay in Dask. And then all of this should take place after you've optimized your code to be as efficient as possible with the resources you have. OK, now let's get some exercise. So this is uh, so the challenge here is I've, I've given you some technical things. And so to reward your patience for sitting through all the technical stuff, we'll do some soft skills. All right, so this soft skills ex exercise is about trying to figure out what is going on in your organization? That is one of the most vital things that you will need as a data scientist. Because if you don't actually know what's going on in your organization, then you can't actually solve the problems that are relevant to your organization, and you can't be successful if you're not doing that. So the dependence there is like you need to understand what your organization is doing. And typically, people won't tell you. Right? They'll only tell you the thing that you need to get done now. Right? They, they want you to do this. You don't have any way of evaluating whether that's actually the thing that's relevant to the business. So you need to be able to do the thing that they're asking you to do and this other thing, which is figure out what is it that the business actually does. So you may in your head have some story about that, but we're going to try and do a little exercise. 
so I'm going to hand out these activities. And these are basically little roles that you will be playing. Uh, and so the trick here is, as a data scientist, you will have a customer for your product, hopefully. And the challenge is to figure out who is your customer's customer. Yeah. I, think I might have one manager left. Oh man, I got one manager. All right, I'll be right back. So in my class, I have like 25 students, and so I have more managers. <laughs> OK, so let's see. Yeah, so the, the answer to this poll, by the way, is no. Your customers will not. So if you're working on a team, which is typically what you'll be working on, your customers will have no idea what they actually want. So then it becomes a challenge of how do you make progress if the people who you're developing a tool for have no idea what they want? Well, the answer is to figure out what their customers want. So that's that's kind of the, the game for tonight. So to make this a little bit more complicated, so you are a person, you have a customer, and that person has a customer. And so the trick is to figure out who is your customer's customer. But to impede you, uh, unfortunately, I only have one manager tonight. So the manager's role, right? If you <laughs> if you've ever worked in an organization. The manager's role, one of their roles, is to make sure that your, your team does not get distracted. Right? So like, they don't want other people coming in and interfering with you. So I only have one manager tonight, Chris. Thank you. Um, but his, his role is to make sure that the people on his team don't get distracted. So he needs to run interference to make sure other people aren't coming in and talking to his teammates all the time. right? So they need to come in through official channels right? and like route the question appropriately. We'll have a meeting later. We'll get back to you next week. It's the usual manager role, right? Not, nothing to despair against managers. That is their purpose, to defend the team. Uh, and so there's only one person, but normally we'd have like a bunch of managers running interference against everybody else. And your job as a data scientist is to get past that manager to the other people to figure out what their customer is. Have I lost anyone yet? OK, we're good. All right, so I think, right. So. <laughs> uh, we have to talk to people, and then I think, yeah. So that's that's the problem is that there's a lot of uh, routing around bureaucratically they have to do. I don't know. Yeah. So you're going to have a role, and so you're going to take uh, a piece of paper that's separate from the one that I gave you, and figure out who is your customer's customer. So you're going to have to go talk to somebody. If you need paper, let me know. I have some paper. Yeah. Okay. Let me take that. Anybody else? Paper, pen? OK, so you're actually going to have to get up and talk to people to figure out who is your customer's customer. Any paper? Yeah? Chris, make sure that your data scientist doesn't get distracted by other people who are trying to interfere with him or her. You got to find your teammate, though. I'm on the software development 
Responsible for your customer's customer, so this should, this should be too bad. All right, so let's take it for like one more minute, and we'll come back to our desk. We'll see if we've solved the problem. Okay, Brian, what team are you on? Software architecture. Okay, and who was your customer? Software dev, okay. Who was your customer's customer? Okay, so let's let's come back to our desk. So so who was on the software sales team? Yeah? Uh, David, who was your customer? Software purchasing, okay. And who was the software purchasing team's customer? Hardware engineering, all right. Okay, uh, so who is on the hardware engineering team? Huh? Who who is your your customer? Hardware manufacturing. All right. All 
All right. And who is their customer? Budget. All right. Man, this is a complicated game here. Who is on the logistics team? All right, Sai? Who, who is your customer? What was it? Hardware sales. And who is their customer? Product purchasing team. All right, who is on product purchasing team? Yeah, okay. Who is your customer? The user. And that was the end of the game, all right. So who else have I not talked to yet? Okay, and where did the hardware team, hardware research team sit? Okay, and what team was, your, was that on? What team? Hardware research team. Was anyone on the hardware research team? All right. So your your customer was hardware engineering. Were that you were the customer of anyone? Or was anyone did anyone have hardware research as a customer? All right. So so that's our dependency. I, I think we haven't missed anyone then, right? Everybody's counted for. All right, so so there's a lot of dependencies, and so basically the the takeaway message from my perspective, why I think this game is a value, is like the people who you're talking to typically don't know what they want, but a way to get ahead of them is to ask what their customer is going to want from them, right? And if you can get some illustration of that, then you'll know what actually these guys should be getting from you. And does that <laughs> have I lost anyone on why we're doing that? Okay, so then the, the meta question, so like, what did you get from this, right? So like, what was your, what were your observations? What, what were the skills required that you would have to take out in your real world business and apply here? Yeah, Amanda. Talk to, oh boy, that's tough. Cold calling, all right. Anyone else? So, so I would advocate, like, it, so it's it's a it's it's a drain. So, like, I think Chris, you're our only manager. Were you successful in defending your team? Ah. The goal of the manager was so so who was on your team? Right. So right. So your your goal as a manager was to try and make sure that the Camille's work. She didn't get distracted by other people coming and talk to her all the time, right? Because like, if you're in an office environment and people just wander by and talk to your team members all the time, they're not going to get any work done. So as a manager, your role is to step in and say, "Hey, she's busy. You know, file an official ticket and come back to me later when you've got real work." Right? So that was the role of the manager. So one of your skills as a data scientist is to work around that barrier of like, I mean, it's a perfectly reasonable barrier to institute, but it's another barrier to work around. Um, See, the last thing is, so when you come to some, yeah, I'm an, I Angel. Like you're yeah. Working and trying to find out who your stakeholder is, sometimes they don't want what you can give them. It's a really hard lesson to learn. What did you do? In, so, so when the customer didn't want what you were giving them, what was your response to that? Um, I mean, it was out of my control. It wasn't just an issue. It was basically, I was told you're, you're doing this and just please don't say today. <laughs> sure, that was received well. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so sometimes you don't, you, you might be in a position where you don't have the authority to say otherwise. But, um, so then it's kind of be sneaky about like how to figure out what they actually want. But, so was it the opportunity to meet with these people uh, who you were delivering things to outside of official channels or not? Yeah, we had a couple meetings, but they, they were never so so hot so right so you mentioned that there was official meetings were there any mm, unofficial meetings or was it only structured official meetings? Okay. As I was kind of protected from that other side. Oh, yeah yeah the politics yeah. right. So so that's uh, usually someone will institute an official meeting right at a scheduled time where everybody's going to sit at a big table and we're going to have a 
get together a session and brainstorm and have requirements and all that good stuff, right? It almost never goes well. Sounds like it didn't go very well. <laughs> it's like it, half the group doesn't want to do the thing in the first place because it's just a hot mess. Right. <laughs> Organizations are hot messes. So what I would advocate, not, not that we can go back and re-engineer this, but in the future, finding the ability to personally connect with someone outside of official channels is often a very useful tactic. Like it's just like, hey, do you want to go get coffee together, right? And like have that non-work focused conversation. And like maybe you don't talk about the project at all, right? But what you're really trying to do is spark that initial, I'm a human, you're a human interaction, right? And then later when they have a question, they can actually come back to you based on that relationship. You don't even have to talk about the project, right? Just let that sort of natural, uh, well, at least there is some effort to be put in, but it's a non-official non channel to, to sort of build relationships. And that's where requirements often sort of slip into normal conversation when you're not actually focused on solving that problem. So I uh, should mention it in passing. You know, I ran into this problem the other day, and I'm like, oh, well, that, I can translate that to a requirement and then solve that problem. So that's what I would recommend there. But yeah, finding those new people. So this is a very artificial environment. You're in the high, I will claim, one of the highest concentrations of data scientists that you'll have in most of your professional career. You're talking with people who will go into diverse fields with different skill sets than you. And so this is a very uh, good time to talk to people who are not like you, who are your, currently your classmates. But later on, after you leave here, you guys will be in different industries talking with different problems and different stakeholders. So establishing and maintaining these connections are pretty vital. Right. So. All right, yeah, so communication's useful, and <laughs> not all people value. So you'd think, if you want a smoothering organization, that communication's a good thing. Not everyone is in favor of that. You'll have to identify those people pretty quickly. And it is, so if you notice, <laughs> this was not an orderly process, right? We did not form lines or queues and then talk to each other for a set amount of time. There wasn't an official process. It was chaotic, right? There was this clump of people in the back. There was a clump over here. Those are sort of like self-organizing features of this communication, right? For whatever reason, right? And so <laughs> it is chaotic. And so that is emotionally burdensome. When, when you're looking around seeking structure and all you see is like this stuff happening, Right, that can be very frustrating. So um, unless you're like ready to surf on the chaos, which is what I try and do, um, it, it looks looks messy, because it is. All right, so there's what we hopefully constructed on the board. All right, so <laughs> all of this was an advertisement that you should go out and figure out who your stakeholders are. You can still proceed, you can make progress without that, um, but it'll be um, maybe not as effective. And your customers don't know what they want, which is why we're doing this in the first place. <clears throat> okay, so we've talked a lot about requirements so far, but what we really want to be able to do is predict what the future needs will be. And and so that's that's another separate skill about what are we doing now, what do we think we'll do in the near future. So the way that I would advertise that, which uh, unfortunately we don't have time to get into tonight, is cost benefit models. So if you can figure out what is your current cost-benefit model, and then figure out what future decisions are coming down the pike, and how the cost-benefit model will change in response to that new environment, that's where you're going to be able to predict what your future needs are. So coming up with a current, so even if your current cost-benefit model isn't that relevant, the, cha the value is in making changes to that cost-benefit model to figure out what your needs will be uh, if there's some change to the environment. So we did a little bit of uh, activity. Now we'll do two more uh, sort of technical focus conversations. So, so far in, in all the previous slides, like multiprocessing, DASC, optimization, those were all about staying in the lovely environment that you know as Python. So it won't always be the case that you should stay in Python. There are valid reasons to figure out uh, when to move. And that basically is this choice of you want to stay with the thing that you know, right, that's comfortable, or you want to change things up, which is going to require a lot of learning. And there'll be some, some expected difficulties associated with that change. So there's like a, a cost 
this thing, and there's a cost to changing. And so it becomes a really hard choice of evaluating what those two choices are and what the cost. And so in a, again, in an organization, there's a lot of bias to stick with what you're already using. That is the what seems like cheaper alternative uh, compared to change. All right. Oh yeah. So, <laughs> by the way, they go back. This is my activity. <clears throat> so it's hard to make a choice between things if you don't know what the choices are among, and so you have to have some mental inventory of the fact that there are alternatives. So this is a handy dandy web page of all the different languages you could be using, but you're not, right? So I don't. I have not done the count to see how many different languages there are. But if you've used like more than five of these, you probably don't belong in this class, right? Like, there's a large number of languages out there, and so one takeaway from this is it's almost not applicable to think that you're going to evaluate how to solve your problem for your business with your data in all these languages. Right? That's just not a reasonable thing to do. So luckily, there's a lot of other um, motives to sort of help you down select that list of choices, right? So like if you can't hire anybody in COBOL, that's probably off your list, right? If the language costs $10,000 per license for seat license, that might be off your list, right, if you don't have a big budget. Um, and then <laughs> there's sort of like the pluses and minuses of knowing what the hot languages are now, right? Like Angle is an old language. We're probably not going to use that because no one's hiring in it. Um, so having familiarity with like what are the hot languages now, right? Like back five to ten years ago, Hadoop was hot. Right now, it's sort of like Spark's new hotness. Right? I don't know whether you want to call it Splunk a language, but there's lots of different languages, and they change in popularity. The relevance of that is um, people, when you try to hire a team, are likely to have some uh, experience with that language. So uh, that's that's the relevant factor there. And then the other sort of like, I guess, I'll, I'll shout out to this one of like, it is having having some computer science ex, uh, knowledge of like why certain languages are more applicable to other problems compared to other ones has some utility. You can sort of like knock out whole categories of languages not being relevant to your problem. Okay, so I, do you still have a piece of paper with you? Everybody not have paper? So we're going to use some, some paper. Now we're going to write down, this is your solo activity, um, what are the costs of switching between programming languages for an existing project? I'll give you about a minute or two to focus on that question. And I'm <laughs> just as a practical experience, right? Like, there isn't a book answer to this one. Ram, can I offer you to, what is your, your brainstorming that you've got for us? Oh, <laughs> sorry. All right, Ram, what have you got?
you got for us? Yeah, so cost of software and design. Okay. So learning, all right. Well, that's good. Well, I get someone else. Uh, let's see, Jason. Ah, so sort of like extra, so unneeded features. So you could go after a software for one purpose, but then it has all this other stuff that's extra and you don't need it. Okay, say now. Training, nice. All right, so like off, you may have like to take your whole team of five developers, put them in training for a week, and then hope that when they come back, they can do something useful, right? So like learning the language itself is like one problem, but sort of, uh, Training. All right. Anyone else have anything to add to that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right. A huge delay. So it's delay uh, progress. Right. So you're, ma you're basically making the choice as a business to say, we're going to stop making progress, change languages, and then hope that by changing languages, we get that. Uh, increase productivity so that we recoup all the costs of the stop. Absolutely, yeah. Hardware change is great. So what would be an example of hardware changes? Okay, so going to the, so cloud. I'm going to give you another example of this. Uh, typically in physics, we'll rewrite our code to go on a GPU. We need to buy a GPU. Yeah. OK. Anyone else? Yeah. Support. Love it. All right. So like, so this could come in a couple different ways. Like, often it comes as a consultant, right? So some consultant swoops in at the cost of $1,000 a day right, to help you out for the next month or two. So absolutely. OK. Yeah. So like, yeah, insufficient staffing, basically, right? Yeah, I guess I'm thinking, like, I can, like, one of my co I work mostly with R, so one of my coworkers can adapt code that I've written in R because she's also writing R. Mm -hmm. But if I'm working on something, if I'm building something kind of JavaScript, she can adapt it. Mm -hmm. So then there's, no, then there's nobody else there that can work with that. Absolutely. So, so you're, you're you're making a choice about how to be effective while trading off the number of people who can participate in the activity. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah. So introducing new bugs. And the first one was. Translate, right. So it's going to move your code base, right? Great. I'm just genuinely curious. Is there anything else? In the, I mean, like, this is a great list. I mean, it, so imagine that you were faced with, like, some young buck coming up in the new organization saying, like, hey, we, we really like TypeScript. We're going to rewrite everything in TypeScript. That's like all these weight, all these factors have to be weighed against that sort of like cool new language, right? Or like what's hot and like so those are those are great suggestions. Okay, so let's see if we caught anything here. New bugs. Oh yeah, so your customers may or may not care. Hopefully they don't care and they can't notice it. But if they're using your software as the tool itself, when you rewrite your tool, your customers may be in for a surprise, right? Also, if you have dependencies, like other code depends on your functionality, that might change when you update your code base. 
right? So the API changes. Uh, architecture is a new, you know, it's usually when you change code bases, you also want to change the overall design and architecture of your product. That may be a great time to do it or a terrible time to do it. And so like, basically, there's a lot of uh, interest in re-architecting a solution when you rewrite your code. <laughs> and then like, if you really don't like firing people, because no one likes firing people, firing people who don't want to learn or don't have the skill, that's another fun thing to do. OK, so I've, I've sort of been talking about like languages that are uh, attractive because they're new and fresh and exciting. Um, if you haven't heard of the Gartner hype curve, the hype cycle, this is a, a, a thing to be aware of in business. Basically, like often you'll hear about things of like when they're on sort of this up upslope of getting more and more popular, people are getting more and more excited about it. Um, and you sort of want to make sure that you're not caught up in that hype. So having some concept of like, has this language been around for more than two years? If the answer is no, then you're probably over here. Right? After people have started implementing this new language and they're really excited, um, then they start realizing, oh, there's all these bugs and these things that we didn't actually intend for and like it doesn't work for these problems, right? So like maybe the new language is great at problem X, but if you're in problem Y and solving the problem Y at a different scale, then that might not be relevant. But that only works itself out naturally after you've implemented a whole bunch of places and then you start realizing where the problems are. And then after a while, so it sort of settles into this, like we know where to use it, when to use it, at what scale to use it, for what problems. So I am sort of a reluctant person to work over here. So I often try and like find myself here or here. But have some concept of where the technology is. Right, so, but this, <laughs> I'm telling you what my choice is. This is totally a choice you and the business you're in gets to make. Right? You have the autonomy to sort of live over here, like paying that high cost of like picking the newest technology, right? That's very cool, but there's a cost to it. And so most people don't hang out in that region. And so uh, I usually advocate for like sitting around here waiting for other people to take the pain and suffering. There is some argument for living over here, right? The advantage is maybe you get to solve problems other people can't at a time scale that's faster than other people can. And there is a big uh, business advantage to that. But the cost is, there's a huge amount of risk of maybe you migrate to the wrong thing too too quickly, and you fail. Right, so that's sort of like the trade-off that you're making there, about where you where you choose to be. All, right, all that was software. The same basically arguments can be applied to hardware. So if you haven't seen pictures like this before, this is your exposure to hardware. Hard drive. This is where your data is stored. Memory, this is your RAM, your fast access, small capacity. Then you have your processor, and they're all stitched together with this thing called a motherboard. And then your your interface is typically a keyboard, mouse, and monitor. So that's how your computer works. <laughs> no? OK. So the, advantage, the, the similar thing happens with hardware. So I'll probably say like 18 months to two years, roughly, you get new technology for a hard drive. New technology means it's faster means it's smaller, takes less power, uh, has more capacity. Right? All those things are good. They're advantageous. So if you're sticking with a hard drive that's 5 to 10 years old, you have less capacity. It's drawing more power. Right? It's slower. Right? And so there's this desire to upgrade to the latest technology. Sound familiar? We just talked about it in software. Right? So the challenger is if you go in too quickly, this newest hard drive is going to have all the bugs that people haven't figured out yet. Right? Hardware has bugs too. They're even worse than software because they're usually not easy to find. So the same thing with memory. You might want the most memory in your computer, and you want to. You're willing to pay extra cost for it. But if the manufacturing process hasn't been smoothed out yet, you're probably going to get some hardware with some defects in it. So again, this is the trade-off you get to make. Processors, obviously, there's things called Moore's law, which is effectively stopped. But we can talk about that later. So. Same thing. So every time you want to upgrade to this new hardware, you're taking on some risk. You're paying extra cost. The question is, do you get the benefit to the efficiency and effectiveness to your business? OK, so <laughs> this is how I spend my life at work, trying to convince, you know, trying to convince people at work of this, this whole process. So basically, never use a computer. You should always, I mean always, start with a paper and pencil. 
only once you have shown that you cannot solve the problem on paper and pencil should you move to a computer. Right? <laughs> That's like your first transition process. So once you've moved to a standard computer, right, then you try and solve your problem. If you're done, you stop. That was easy. Right? And then if you can't solve your problem on a standard computer, you should keep that hardware and just optimize the software. That's cheaper. It's almost always cheaper uh, to spend like an hour or two optimizing your software. Then once you've found that your hardware is not sufficient, your optimized software is not sufficient, either the problem is too big, like too much data, or it's taking too long to solve, right? then you'd say, oh, maybe I should get a GPU, or maybe I should do something else with that hardware. Right? And then, after you've done all of these things, that's when you should move to a larger computer, like many nodes or you know, a, a, a supercomputer. Only then, after you've done all this, it's almost, <laughs> this is like where it gets hard. Almost always, people see a problem. They want to move right to the biggest computers, the fastest things, because they're super lazy, and they don't want to do any of this work. That's the normal normal path. Yeah. So if you're looking to buy like the biggest, most expensive instance on Amazon, you're probably wasting your money unless you've done all these other things. Yeah. So just because someone throws more data than you're used to at you, it doesn't mean you have to buy more computers. It means you can do all these other things. Mostly people are too lazy to think about that as they just jump right to the most expensive solution the first. All right. All right. So we're going to go down a little bit of a rabbit hole because this is one of the most common distractions that people are faced with is a GPU. So you're going to, I know that, well, I think that you will all take a machine learning class here at UMBC. Is that correct? Either in it or going to. Yeah. So. So once you've taken that class, you will now have some technical exposure as to why GPUs are useful. All right, so they're general, generally for dense linear algebra, which is what uh, deep networks are, are, are there for. And so uh, you get to make this trade-off about which GPU am I uh, using, how often should I upgrade my GPU, all that stuff. Um, and so there's a lot of sort of more trade-offs to think about when you make your hardware more complicated. And that may actually be genuinely of use, but whenever someone tells me they want AI or machine learning in their product, they usually don't know what they're talking about. They usually have Excel spreadsheets that they hand me, and then I go off and solve their problem with Data 601 techniques, and I say I didn't use any machine learning, and they're un that's not what they wanted. They wanted a product that had AI in it. And I, this is a problem I don't know how to solve. Right? Someone wants AI in their Excel spreadsheet. I have a really hard time delivering that, but that's where you'll be. So hopefully, when you take the machine learning class, one of the things you learn out of 602 is when not to use it. I don't know if they ever cover that, but that's what I'd advocate. Okay, we will see if I can get you out here on time. All right. <laughs> so this is the advertisement for my class, which you're not in, but I'll tell you what my class does. So in my class, uh, before this before this lecture, I have my students go to the Amazon, Google, and Azure pricings for the different cloud offerings. And I ask them, how much does it cost to store this much data? How much does it cost to get this much compute? How much does it cost to move this data off the network? Right? And they always come back with these huge ranges of like, one student will have discovered that it costs $10,000. Another student will have discovered that it costs 10, right? And I'm just like, this is the story of cloud, right? Is that trying to find coherent, consistent pricing on anything is impossible, and that's by design. Right? Who here knew that? Like cloud folks, the, the cloud, provi cloud service provider, not to speak bad about them, but they're inherent, they're intentionally obfuscating how much it costs to use their services. Because what they really want you to do is just use their service and then figure out how much it costs you. It's slightly different, right? You never walk into the grocery store and say, could I use that flour? And the grocer says, absolutely. And then you walk out, you make your bread. Oh, it cost me 10 bucks. That's cool, here's 10 bucks. Th that's not normally how we operate. Right? But that's how cloud services operate. So to give you an idea of like, <laughs> someone did a bunch of work, so this is hopefully to save you a bunch of work, that they wanted to go off and calculate how much it costs to do certain operations in the cloud, right? Like move between regions, um, move out of the network, 
right? Move your data. Um, so all of these things have a cost associated with them. So that's cool. I mean, like someone actually got the right answer, whatever the current right answer is. The problem is, in order for you to calculate how much cost it would need for you to solve your problem with your data, that you'd have to do all these intricate calculations on this flow diagram, and then say, you know, over the period of a month, it will cost my business $10,000 to do Project X. That's really difficult, given even this accurate information. So <laughs> this is one of the challenges I suspect some of you, not all of you, but some of you will face of, like, Someone wants you to move their code onto the cloud, and they're going to say, how much does this cost me? And this is an answer key, although you can sort of see why it's so complicated to answer that question. Okay, That was my quick advertisement for service provider pricing. <laughs> I'll wait for questions on that one. You all feel confident, I guess? <laughs> All right. Has anyone here working in a business been faced with this question of let's move to cloud? Has anyone lived through that that ordeal? No? Okay. Good. <laughs> Hopefully you can avoid that discussion. All right. Another little side observation. I mean, this is not my conspiracy theory. This is just facts, right? So, <laughs> so a lot of the cloud service providers offer training in machine learning. So there's a reason that they do that. Right. Once you're trained up on how to use Google's uh, TensorFlow, right? What platform will you be using TensorFlow on? Google Compute Engine. That's their offering. Right. So like like that's their incentive is they want you to get to their platform for their machine learning. So. All right. So if you don't have paper, I'll get you some paper. I'm any paper. Yeah. Paper. So uh, you'll be collecting, you'll be turning these pieces of paper in, 